Today, we're going to talk about testing just in general and how you should think about testing and some things you can avoid so that the tests that you write are as good as they can possibly be. So a great place to start when you think about automated testing, whether you aren't actually doing any automated testing right now or whether you are and you're just not super comfortable with it or you're not sure if you're doing it the right way, is to kind of go back to the beginning and think about why you're doing it or the the reasons behind testing. So the questions that you might ask yourself are going to be, why am I testing this? What should I be testing? And how should I test this? And we're going to break down what these are, and then we're going to go through some anti-patterns and ways that you can avoid making mistakes when you're writing tests. So for why am I testing this, I would classify there as being right around three reasons why people end up testing things. They do it for regression, prevention. So these, this is regression testing. This is you write a test in order to prevent a bug from occurring later on so you know that when something breaks. The next reason is going to be behavior-driven tests, or uh, I call this usage-informed software design, which is a really wordy way of saying it, but it's you write your test so that you can see how you want the code to be used so that you know what to write, which is kind of a really weird way of looking at it, uh, but this falls under the camp of uh, BDD, or behavior-driven design. But basically, uh, if you're doing this sort of thing, then you're going to be writing your tests first first so that you are getting some design feedback while you're creating your code. And then the last thing I like to think about as a reason why you might want to write tests would be executable documentation or uh, tests as documentation. And depending on the language that you're using, this can mean a couple different things. For instance, in Python and Elixir, they have the concept of doc tests, which are you can use the documentation strings, you can annotate them in such a way that you can basically have a little REPL that you create inside of a comment. And then when you run your tests, you can have it run those. And that way, if the method that is being described doesn't match, the documentation that you've written and it like say fails, does not return the right thing, then your actual test suite will fail. So your documentation doesn't go stale in that way. The other way of looking at this is if you are using a language that doesn't have those kind of tests, for instance, Ruby doesn't have that kind of test, but you write tests in such a way that they act as documentation so that somebody could learn how to use your code. And if you're following the second approach here, where you're using your tests to inform how you design your code, then the way that you write these sort of tests will almost always turn into this sort of documentation. You might have some extra tests that are more like implementation detail that you only write for regression purposes, say to catch an edge case. But for the most part, your tests are going to act in such a way that if somebody were to read them and really go through and see what's going on, that they would have a better understanding of what your code does. A big portion of this sort of thing is basically just writing a good test name or a test case description. So moving on, if we look at what should I be testing, uh, I have a really simple flow chart that I kind of go through for this particular question in my head. And that is, is the code private? So this just means, is it part of my public API? Do I expect you to... Uh, create an object and actually call this method on the object, or is it something that I would rather you not be able to do it? Some languages don't really have private and protected or those statuses for methods on objects necessarily, but in say Ruby, they do, even though it's kind of fake, you could still call the same method. But if I put something as being private, then that means you can't under normal circumstances call it. So for me as the person writing the code, I would not write a test for that. And the reason for this is that if it's a private method, then it's either never going to be used or it's going to be used by one of my public facing methods that are part of the public API and I will write tests for the public API. So in a roundabout way, this private code's going to be tested or it's going to be dead code. And by not writing tests for private code, then that means I don't have brittle tests that are going to break if I change implementation details of my actual public API. So the other thing that I take a look at is is the code part of another library? So, and what I mean by this is if you're working in Rails, am I testing something that is probably already tested by Rails itself? 
So a good example of this is if you are doing some sort of controller testing and you're testing things that are being set on the request that you personally are not setting them, you're just ensuring that Rails is setting something on the request. That would be an over you know, an over testing scenario. Like you're testing something that you honestly don't have any control of right now. And if there's a bug in it, it's going to be found in the Rails core, probably not in your code, or you're going to be the one to help find it. But you writing that test is kind of silly because then if the maintainer of the library you're working with makes a change to an implementation detail, maybe, then it's going to break a test in your code and it really shouldn't do that. So these are the two questions I kind of ask myself to, to determine like if or not I should test a particular piece of code. And then the other thing that I consider is whether or not I have too much coverage. So if I'm testing too many things, I like to unit test things because it's simple and you can inject your dependencies and you can more easily control the external circumstances. But that doesn't mean you need to unit test everything, especially if you're going to have some top level tests. So the higher up the stack you get to have acceptance tests or integration tests that connect a bunch of little pieces of your application I would, you know, have fewer and fewer of those tests because what you're really doing, if you have good unit test coverage, is you're testing more of the underlying features again and again and again. So that's one thing to consider is if you have good unit test coverage and you have an adequate amount of higher level tests is to not go nuts on the high level tests. And that really does sum up the how should I test this bit is basically use unit tests as much as possible. And don't overuse top-level tests. And these are obviously guidelines that I have for myself when I think about writing tests. And I'm a practitioner of the BDD, or what I called usage-informed software design up here. Um, but So I like to write my tests first, and I like to write them from the standpoint of I'm going to be the person using them. And that leads me to write a lot of unit tests. But... A lot of times in this particular case, you start with a top-level acceptance test. So if you're working on something in a Rails application, you would maybe write a test that actually invokes a web browser, it navigates to a route, calls some things, and you assert that certain things are going to be shown on the page. It kind of works its way down, and so you write a test for something up top in the behavior, and then that leads you to writing the code that's lower and lower, and then you write the test that eventually leads you to writing the implementation that makes sense for how you want to use the code. So I hope this makes sense. And this is kind of the really brief way that I like to think about testing. And if you're going to try to pitch testing to somebody like uh, a business uh, side of things at your particular company, then obviously the regression prevention part or the, the ability to catch bugs so they never happen again, or make sure you can't break the features that you already have, that's really valuable. And a lot that's probably the easiest way to pitch this to a um, business stakeholder in your software. But I would say these other two are super useful if you have a team or a team that's growing or if you just want to have kind of a better idea of uh, designing software. I do think it helps to practice BDD for a little while, even if it's not necessarily your way of thinking about things normally, is that it, I do think it makes you think about the API that you're building before you actually get in there, even if you have sort of ideas about the implementation. So now that we have these general ideas, let's take a look at some of the problems and super easy mistakes that people do when they're writing tests. And if you avoid these, it'll actually help you out quite a bit. So I have these uh, broken down to a couple different sections. We're going to use RSpec as our examples here. But uh, failing to assert is a kind of silly error that surprisingly slips through a lot. Like I've written quite a few tests that I failed to assert. So if I actually run this test, it'll say it passes, and that's because I didn't actually do anything here. Like, I'm running this code that this should evaluate to true or false, and obviously I would expect that to, to raise an error, but since I didn't assert that it was supposed to be true, uh, it's never actually going to pass. So always make sure that you're testing something, and this is where the idea of red-green refactor comes in from the TDD side of things. And that is get your test to fail first. That way you can get it to pass. Because if it's if it's green from the start, then that that means either yes, you wrote code that does work, or you know, no, you actually wrote a test that doesn't work, if that makes sense. You have a test that cannot fail, therefore it's not providing you any value. So always make sure that you can make your tests fail. Even if you do get it to go green first, go and you know, toggle your expectations so that it does fail. If you expected it to be two, change the expected value to be one, run the test again, make sure it fails. This is kind of a pet peeve of mine, but uh, I call this showing implementation details in your tests. And uh, 
This is a an example of this test. So let's let's comment this out. And what this is doing is I created this class that takes a length and a width and it will return you the area. So we're testing the area and we're saying that I expect the area to equal the length that I passed in and the width. And so if I run this now, it'll pass. That's fine. But since I'm calling other methods to determine the actual uh, output, I'm just saying, oh, this is how I'm going to implement the function inside of my object. So, you know, this will this will always pass. The problem is, is you can totally change this and make it pass even though it's wrong. So just looking at these numbers, you know, we would expect area to equal 30, right? So this, this is what we're expecting. But with the change I just made up here to length being one, what we're actually going to get back is five. And if I save this and run it, it's still going to pass. So if we instead change this to be 30 based on the numbers that we have up here, and if you wanted to, you could still, you can still do five times six, but this is explicit. It is not tied to the object under test. So if we save this, run it, it'll fail. It fails because it got six instead of, oops, I apparently didn't do math right. Oh, length times width. Yeah. So that shows us that we can remove this run it again, and we get a, a pass there. And so don't write your tests in such a way that they hint at the implementation of whatever is under test. I find it better to be explicit, and being explicit in this way is actually a pretty good way of documenting your code too. Like it's area, it's going to be 30. If you you know really needed to put a comment here, you could say area of rectangle is length times width which is fine and this would you know help educate somebody who doesn't know anything about you know how geometry is done which is fine so this would help in that way but your test would not ever break if somebody came in here and overwrote a method and you didn't know about it all right the last example that i'm going to show you of a kind of an anti-pattern that can make you write some poor tests is overstubbing and that is when you kind of swizzle is what it's called uh, you swizzle a method on an object that is also being under test. And this can lead to some really weird examples. So in this particular case, what we've got is we have this class that is a worker and it's written in such a way that it's supposed to be a parent class. Like you would have other occupations uh, inherit from this. So you could have a doctor or a PhD um, or a you know, dentist or whatever inherit from this and they would be the ones expected to add their own title to it. This is obviously not how I would write this. I would probably just pass in the title and then just use a single object, wouldn't need any inheritance. But for the for the sake of demonstrating this, it has a method that should always raise because you're expecting this to be implemented by a child class. And this test down here, though, what we do is we create a worker, Kevin Bacon, and then we stub. So we swap out the implementation of title so that it says PhD, and then we run this test. But in reality, like this will pass, but this would never work in the real world. Like this is not true. This would raise an error. Like if I remove this line, then I get a failure because it actually raises an error and this is what it should do. So rather than writing stubs all over the place in order to make your test pass, if you have to stub a lot of things or if you have to stub the actual object under test, which I would say that's a red flag right there, probably don't stub the object under test almost ever. But if you do have to use a lot of stubbing, then maybe that shows you that your design is a little wonky and you need to change something about how you're writing your code. So those are just a couple examples of some easy things you can do to make sure that your tests are better. Always make sure that you're asserting. Make sure that your test implementations don't actually show you what the object expected implementation is. And try not to overstub things. Showing you what not to do is not the same as showing you what a good test looks like. So for that, we're actually going to swing on over and we're going to take a look at the Stripe Ruby library. And we're just going to look at a sample test. So these are some pretty simple tests. They're not doing anything too incredible. They have to do some specific stuff where they pop off some configuration and ensure that it gets set back. But for the most part, they are calling a method and then they are, you know, making an assertion about that with explicit data. So they are setting some information and then they're coming back and being like, okay, this, if I call the method on my object, it should return the proper information. And this might not seem like a lot, but this is super simple. And it tells you what it does, right? So it allows app info to be configured. This is just saying that I, if I call a method to set it, then when I read it off, it's going to actually return me the proper information. And this simple, simple way of looking at a test can be applied to almost all unit tests. And you'll lead, you'll get tests that are not super long, which makes them easy to read. And if something is wrong, they'll be super obvious most of the time. 
So I think with the questions we talked about earlier about how you should be going about testings and the things you can consider and what not to do, if you just apply those to the idea of, I want to have a really short test that does test one thing and tests it well in as simple a way as I can, then a lot of times you'll end up with tests that are really flexible and they can grow with you and they're not going to get in your way. So just think about that. And if you want to learn more about testing, this is one way that I would suggest going about doing it is go and find a popular Ruby library and go look at the tests. And um, if you wanted to, you could actually pull down the repo and like check some churn stats on it to see how often code is being changed. Because if a test is changing a lot, then that either means that the feature isn't quite right or those tests are bad is another potential thing. Those tests are constantly being rewritten as brittle. So that's kind of a problem. But those are some things to consider. And I hope this was helpful for you. I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, be sure to leave a comment down below telling me why you liked it and what you're going to do with this knowledge. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you can get more of these tutorials each week. And also don't forget to join us on Patreon, Facebook, Slack, so you can keep the chat going, and on Twitter. But as always, have a nice week.